Donald Clark, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It's about the technology. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I worked in the games industry for two years, and I went to games conferences, and I never heard the kids saying, oh, it's about the games, it's not about the technology. <laughs> no, it's about the consoles, it's about the technology and learning. You know, if we didn't have Google, we wouldn't have search. That was about the technology. It wasn't learning people who came up with Google. It wasn't learning people who came up with Facebook. It was a piece of brilliant technology that enabled things. That's not to say that learning doesn't matter. But it's a bit like going along to a pet food conference where there's always 20 people in the audience say they don't like pets. I don't even get this, really. You know, it's only in educational learning conferences that we say, oh, that technology, I don't like it very much. We have to deal with it. So I'm going to try and do a counterpoint, in a sense, to that this morning. By starting with learning theory, however, uh, as I just said, I'm just back from Africa, which is a very interesting experience. And it was interesting because the very first piece of technology invented by our species, or at least before Homo sapiens, in fact, was the stone axe. And for one and a half million years, that was the only piece of technology really worth looking at. That's where all the evidence is. But it's absolutely fascinating, the stone axe, because it's a window into our consciousness. It was the first example of a piece of technology where very clearly you had to be taught a skill. And it gives us a window into consciousness because you also had to plan, you had to find the resources, you had to have a purpose and intent for making these tools, which is either, you know, kill something to eat it or protect yourself because you're going to be eaten. Now, that, that whole notion of a piece of technology that betrays the process of cultural teaching and learning was there from the very beginning. But something very interesting happened around axes about... You know, there are tens of thousands of axes that have no wear and tear on them at all. These were also found in Africa. And on the one on the right-hand side here is about a foot high. It clearly had no practical purpose because even then, technology had a sort of status purpose. You know, people actually, it was quite cool, you know, to have in your little bag. And in fact, I've got a bigger axe than you and a, a latest form of the axe. That was cool as well. And that's the thing about technology. We've got to learn some of the some of the affordances of technology itself to really understand it and play with it. And we'll all have heard those sneering people who say, oh, you know, I don't use Twitter because, you know, it's just people telling me I've had a cup of tea or, or that sneering thing about Facebook. Well, I don't care if you don't use Facebook, but don't tell me not to use it. And don't sneer about something you don't know about, anything about. We have to learn to embrace technology if we're going to get anywhere. Or L&D will be stuck forever in the world of foxes, glass hair, mints and flip charts. That's the truth of the matter. Don't imagine that all that learning stuff's great without technology, or that you don't use technology. There's a lectern standing there, which comes from medieval church preaching versus teaching. So there are similarities in a way. Our history has always had technology and learning. We've always liked those little things that we have in our pocket, whether they be mobile phones or axes, that are useful to us personally. We've always loved technology. In fact, the only place I really encounter an anti-technology vibe is sometimes at education conferences. That's the truth of them, honestly. Wait, honestly. This is a very interesting example about 40,000 years ago when suddenly human consciousness sprung into action and we had a real sign of how people looked at learning. There was a whole load of, sort of bogus theory in the 60s and 70s about all these cave paintings about 40, 30,000 years ago, really being about shamanism and religion. Actually, read the literature now, it's absolutely fantastic, because what they found out is that these cave paintings show real narratives, and this was about being prey or being predator. And those dark images, I've been into the Altamira cave, and you go into the back and there's a sort of flickering light and a torch, and it is like a classroom or a simulator. This was about teaching kids how to avoid being eaten or to catch things to eat, you know? Let's be quite practical about this stuff. So even then, we have some wonderful examples. If you've ever been and seen a lion hunt in Africa, that's exactly the pose lions have as they stretch out across the grass and come down towards their prey. Some really interesting insights into the eternal use of technology and learning. Now, this is, the, this is my, my, my two and a half thousand years of learning theory, and we're going to spin through this really quickly. And what is amazing after two and a half thousand years is that the second person on this slide, Plato, had the first university called the Academy. 
And it lasted for 900 years, longer than any modern university. And still today, you can go into any university, anywhere in the UK, and you'll see a lecture that was delivered in exactly the same way that Plato delivered it. After 2,500 years of learning theory, folks, nothing changed. Absolutely nothing. So, you know, it's all about learning. Well, maybe not, if nothing changes. So the first bash here, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. Now, Socrates was right. He warned us all about all this bookish stuff and getting too academic about things and liked to have dialogue with people. He thought one-on-one, -on -one, not group learning, by the way, one-on-one -on -one was terribly important. And we, of course, immediately abandoned it. Plato abandoned it almost immediately when he set up an institution and took learning out of the agora into the academy. We did have Aristotle who gave us the scientific method. More of that later because we seem to studiously ignore science and learning. Uh, for the life of me, I don't know why. Now, you may not think that these guys have much to do to learning, uh, with learning, Confucius, Jesus, Muhammad, but I presume you have been watching the news. If you don't think Muhammad has got anything to do with the educational system, then, uh, you know, watch the evening news. He's still alive and well, as is Jesus. But that tradition of the parable was a good thing. But as I say, we still have the old pulpits in the old learning world, the lecterns here. Uh, you know, the, the, the religious schools in this country are a big deal. They're a big deal in the Middle East. In Islam, the word Quran means recitation. I've spent a considerable amount of time in the Middle East, and you can go into schools and universities and see recitation and rote learning as the only method of learning. It's highly prized in, the, uh, in, in schools in the academic world in the Middle East, but it's not necessarily a good thing. Then we have Calvin and Luther, the Protestant, Sorry, this is Calvin and Ignatius, the Catholic and Protestant versions. I come from Scotland, deeply dark Calvinist country. Uh, and believe me, if you don't think Calvin is alive and well, go to Scotland, where the schools are separated into Catholic and Protestant schools. It's like a little Northern Ireland. If you don't think that that Catholic-Protestant split, split is still around in our learning world, then think again, because it is, and it's a massively destructive thing. I met my first Catholic in Scotland when I was 17, when I went to university. Ronnie Heinze was the best man at my wedding. That was the first time I ever met a Catholic. How good is that for society? And of course, we did get the lecture. You'll all have seen this slide by now, but this was 1340, University of Bologna. Lecturer, people in the rows, exactly like any university today, exactly like you guys sitting in front of me, absolutely now. But this image which the artist <laughs> got is absolutely, still I love this picture. This is before books, the guy fast asleep, and look at everybody else, he's asleep, the guy in the green is playing around with his blackberry at the back, all that sort of stuff, you know. Nobody's listening, the artist got it spot on. And you can go into universities up and down the land today and witness this happening. Then something really interesting happened, and that was the Enlightenment, okay? In the 18th century, we have John Locke, who really starts writing about learners and motivation, and how you really have to pay attention to what learners do, because they're all different and we have to pay attention to that fact. Then Rousseau comes along and writes an unbelievable book called Emile, actually a novel, pointing out that actually children do have a spirit of adventure and learning in them, which you can so easily distinguish if you, uh, if you batter them over the head with failure. He did give all five of his newly born children away at an orphanage, so I'm not too sure about his pedigree in terms of his advice. Nevertheless, interesting stuff. And then Millie Wilson-Craft, who was the first person to write about education and women really seriously and say, this is just ridiculous. And you may wonder why there are not many women on this slide, and that's because women were excluded from education really until the university education, certainly until the latter half of the 20th century. There were still colleges in the 1970s in Oxbridge that didn't admit women. And at least we had some uh, brave souls such as Mary Wilson-Craft coming out with this. Then something really terrible happened in terms of the technology, and it was a Scots guy called James Pillins from Edinburgh, where I come from, and he invented the blackboard. <laughs> Tail end of the Enlightenment, where suddenly teachers went to the back of the room, did stop talking to their pupils, turned their back on them, and started scribbling things up on these things. And when I went to Edinburgh University, that's exactly what I got in physics and maths classrooms. I got some guy, introvert, standing with, they had three chalkboards, one, two, three, I remember it still, and he just wrote here, here, and here, and that was called learning. And it still is called learning in those, some of those institutions. However, we had a countercurrent in the States, and this is William James, Principles of Psychology, the father of psychology and learning, who wrote a lot about learning and the, the need to look at individuals and encourage the habit of learning in individuals. He was big on habits, which I agree with as well. And John Dewey, 
who still gave us a brilliant piece of advice, which we studiously ignore, which is that learn by doing. Learning by doing really matters. We learn most of what's useful for us by doing it. And what do we do? We shove people in classrooms, we get the flip chart out, we lecture them, and we don't let them do anything. We know that's true. Which is why compliance training, ethical training, doesn't matter a job. Which is why the RBS nearly took the world's economy under. I spent years delivering compliance training at that organization. It made not a jot of difference. In fact, it was counterproductive. But here's something interesting happened in the early 20th century, which was Marxism. Now, I mention this because these guys had a big influence in educational thinking and still doing teacher training in a sense. Marx didn't write much about education. But people like Althusser, Gramsci, Habermas, and so on, did think that the state was an instrument of control in education. And that's actually true today. Anybody who reads anything about Michael Gove will fully understand that he does absolutely want to hammer you into his public school model and all your kids. And he wants to change the model so quickly that you can't reverse it. So the state still plays this huge and, I think, destructive role in the education process. Then we have... Uh, <laughs> Social constructivist. I'm not a social constructivist. It seems to be the liberal orthodoxy of the day. I am not a social constructivist. I don't believe that all learning should be social. I don't think that the 23 million people who are taking MOOCs at the moment do it because it's a social experience. In fact, I can tell you the data on that. It's less than 14% of people actually participate in the forums. And when you ask them whether the forums were any use, only 7% say it was of any use to them in the learning experience. This thing that was presented this morning of, oh yeah, they get together in Starbucks, less than 0.01% people in MOOCs <laughs> meet in Starbucks. They want fucking learning. They don't want to meet in Starbucks all the time. You know, they would have gone to colleges to do these things, those 23 million people. They didn't because they didn't want to go back to college and university and sit in classrooms. That's not what MOOCs are about. Piaget, by the way, still alive and kicking in some train the trainer courses, I've heard that nothing he wrote was true. He was a terrible scientist. It turned out that his four stages of development were all wrong. All the subsequent research shows that, but he's still hanging around like an old ghost in those programs. Then we have the behaviorists, of course, uh, Pavlov, hmm. uh, you know, people are not dogs. Then we have Thorndike, a very interesting character, not really a behaviorist, because Thorndike looked at the transfer of learning. You know, if you do a simulation or you do any kind of training, will that skill transfer to the real world? Brilliantly insightful man. And he told us right, way back at the other, why are, you, why are you teaching kids Latin in schools? Well, the excuse is it helps them learn other Romance languages. No, it doesn't. There is no transfer between those two things at all. Nothing at all. In fact, it can be counterproductive, and I can show you the data that shows that that's the case. Then we have psychoanalysis, Freud, Rogers, Erickson, identity crisis stuff, and so on. And again, only a few weeks ago, we had mindfulness being injected into the agenda in schools. Oh, yeah, have you heard, l has got to take mindfulness into consideration. Every little adult fad that comes along, teachers and trainers have got to inject it into their classrooms. No. No, you don't. No, you don't. Don't, there's nothing survived from Freud, Freudian theory. Absolutely nothing has survived. And it's hanging around as if HR people should really be in charge of my personal emotional development. I don't think so. Leave me alone in terms of my emotions. You know? I don't mean getting training courses, but I'm not going to be counseled by you. Then we have, this is more to do with schools, Montessori, Steiner, and the great Sterling, the guy behind <laughs> University of Phoenix, and so on. An interesting little countercurrent to this were people like Illich, White, Freire, who were de-schooling people, who didn't like institutional education, who thought it was a crippling experience for many people. Good for some, but not good for others. Interesting little countercurrent here, but didn't have any long-lasting effect. But this is the group I want to talk about today, because these are the psychologists of learning, the serious people who really did the good work. And it started with Ebbinghaus in 1885. Uh, who came up with the forgetting curve, still perhaps the most important piece of theory. It's been around for 120 years, gets completely reinforced every time we do any research, and is still 100% studiously ignored in training and education. We do nothing about space practice after. Well, some people do, but very, very few. Why do we ignore it? Because it's difficult. I'll talk about that a wee bit later. Chunking. Well, if you look at the top thing, you can see that chunking does work, especially if it's meaningful. Do we chunk things enough? Perhaps not. Perhaps still, you know, courses have got progressively shorter, thank God, because they were full of padded out nonsense. You know, remember those days when you went to a stately home and did a three-month induction course? 
forgot it all by the time you got back into the workplace. Thankfully, all that's gone. Chunking does matter. Atkinson and Schifrin, the whole notion of sensory short-term memory, long-term memory. You really have to get to grips with this stuff if you're going to avoid the pitfalls of cognitive overload. Working memory, where I badly unpack that tiny little hole that you have to get through into the mind of learners. We're always over-egging that. We're always delivering too much, too quickly to people, not giving them enough feedback, and it's failing because we don't really understand the limitations of working memory. And forget, I, saw, I was at an inset day not long ago in a local school where they were still doing uh, Miller's 7 plus and minus 2. 7 plus and minus 2. It's 50 years old, that theory, and it's actually wrong. You know, we've had 50 years of theory showing that actually the register in working memory is more like 3 or 4. It's got nothing near 7. It's only to do with objects that you're deliberately trying to remember on a table. Then we have the wonderful tooling, semantic and episodic memory. Semantic memory, math, language, that symbolic stuff. Episodic memory, the sort of memory you had when you were in the pub last night and somebody cracked a joke and you're recalling it, that sort of videotape, autobiographical memory. Still far too much semantic memory, far too much text, far too much bookish stuff around. Socrates warned us of this two and a half thousand years ago. Far too many manuals, far too much text. That's training and education. And then we have Ericsson on deliberate practice. You know that kid who was playing the golf this morning? I thought that was a complete counterexample to what he was saying. That kid didn't, didn't learn socially. That kid was in the middle of nowhere and learned purely and utterly from YouTube videos. I actually don't buy the anecdote either. Usually when you look into those anecdotes, you find there's a father as a coach. He clearly had enough money to buy a top set of golf clubs, so he wasn't exactly living in a mud hut sort of thing, you know? I think we've got to be very careful of anecdote as opposed to data in these situations. And anyway, it was a perfect example of completely and utterly solitary learning, <laughs> not social learning at all. But this guy, Erickson, showed that how this was really important. There was a great speaker here in January called Matthew Syed. He was the British uh, table tennis champion for 10 years. Anybody attend that talk? It was absolutely marvelous, I thought. And the guy, he said, I was, I was the table tennis champion for 10 years in Britain. Then his second sentence was absolutely astonishing. He said, the next five people in the rankings all came from the next two streets to me. And you go, wow, what an amazing sentence. And that's because they had a brilliant table tennis club and they just practiced like hell. It's all about practice. And that's what we're also ignoring in learning theory. And I don't know about you, but I've spent a lot of my time in classrooms and meetings where people are showboating and I'm not getting a lot of learning or a lot of practice. To be honest, I like solitary learning. I don't mind it at all because it's often very productive. And I don't want that to be flooded by the social experience necessarily. Social learning can be good, but let's keep it in its place. Then we have these guys. Now, you'll all have heard of these, because in L&D, these are the kingpins. So we've got Mager, the guy who gave us the hideous learning objectives at the beginning of every damn e-learning course I see still. You know, and the objectives of this course will be blah, blah, blah. All that trainer speak. What on earth are you doing boring people shitless at the beginning of every course? <laughs> Seriously. I don't mean learning objectives if you're designing the course. That's like a hammer for a joiner, but you don't hit the person who buys a house over the head with a hammer. You know, we've got to get out of this trainer speak and flip chart stuff. Then we have uh, Gagne, who also enshrined learning objectives as the second of his nine steps, made e-learning incredibly tedious if you follow that nine-step instructional process. No sense of craft storytelling if you follow the method. Then we have Kolb. At least with Kolb, we have experiential learning coming back into the mix, although I don't agree with his theory. In fact, it was proved wrong by Uncle Johansson shortly afterwards, but never mind. At least we have an attempt here. And then we have Bloom, who again widened out that notion away from just academic knowledge into motor skills and, of course, practical skills as well. So some useful stuff here. Then it all went peak tong again after that. We have Mr. Abraham Maslow, my pet hate, really, you know, that bloody triangle, if I see that in another train trainer's course, you know, I will, I will, I will smash the projector. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with learning. It's a primitive view of human nature. It's just trite. And I actually rather like this thing that's doing the round on uh, Facebook. <laughs> you know, this looks as though it's like a 10-year-old kid who's gone, bugger that, this is what really matters. You think the technology doesn't matter? Yes, it bloody well does. That is the nonsense. Supposed learning theory? I think not. Uh, by the way, the other, two, uh, the other two here as well, while we're at it. McLuhan, that's good. That notion that, you know, linear, that sort of linear media, the past, film, TV, isn't quite right. Maybe breaking up away from books. Seligman, Professor Seligman, Mr. Happiness, 
That was another short-lived thing. Yeah, every HR department, let's all be happy in the workplace. No, 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 it ain't gonna be work. I don't want a workplace of 200 chuckling idiots. I really don't. I want serious competencies. I don't want laughter all the time. This idea that, you know, this notion of happiness, again, an impoverished view of human nature. We had a brilliant debate in the early 19th century with serious people like Mill and Bentham, which showed that this was a, a really stupid way of looking at human nature. But still, it bounces back at us every time by these, these sort of hokey academics in a way. Then something horrible happened again. The pop psychologist, of Mr. Bandler of NLP fame, who famously shot his girlfriend through the head with a Colt 45. Lovely guy. Uh, NLP, NLP. And that's in our universities. People are delivering courses in this rubbish. You know, have a look at some of the NLP websites in the States showing kids how to hypnotize girls and have sex with them. It's bogus. Bogus hypnotherapy as a basis. And the scientific basis, the representation of the mind that it presents is rubbish. Out of it, and also out of it, Kobe, unfortunately, came this guy as well. Mr. Fleming, who gave us the learning styles theory. We may want to talk about learning, but let's talk about crap learning theory. And learning styles is one of those. Visual auditory, auditory and kinesthetic. My kid's got a badge. I have twin boys that got a badge. One of them was kinesthetic, the other one was visual. In the primary school, I went apeshit. <laughs> Neth, are you doing? Stereotyping kids in primary school with stupid badges with no scientific basis whatsoever. You know, Carl was a fidgety kid because boys are bloody fidgety. He's not a kinesthetic being, a fucking pigeon. Made even worse by Mr. Honey and, Mumf Honey and Mumford. Mr. Honey doesn't like me much because that really came from this guy here. A completely bogus, the, in this case, you know, it looks great in the four-step diagram, the learning styles theory. You try building a course with Honey and Mumford's learning style. You know, if we do all that Honey and Mumford's learning style stuff at the course, then what do we do with them? We deliver the same old classroom course anyway. It doesn't matter to make any difference. Nobody cares because it's not true. Even worse, Cyril Burt, who gave us the 11 plus. I was the last cohort in Scotland to do the 11 plus. Cyril Burt falsified all his results. He was proved to be a fraud, but we still have the 11 plus in Kent in England. Uh, we have iSync. That obsession with testing, you may, my kids are now out of the schooling system and I'm damn glad because you may as well bloody fix them up to a perpetual testing machine. They were tested all the time. And it seems to go on and on and on and get younger and younger and younger. And it was always summative assessment. It was hardly any good formative assessment. It was always just trying to categorize people as winners and losers. If that's right in learning, then I'm gonna give up. Gardner as well, I'm a bit suspicious. This was a reasonable attempt, but multiple intelligence sort of just maps the curriculum a bit. I'm not too sure that there's much science behind the actual categories of skills he has. And then something really awful. And I feel awful saying this because he's got the same first name as me, Donald Kirkpatrick, and he died recently, but his son has taken over the business. It's not so much a theory, the Kirkpatrick uh, process of evaluation. is a little business, a little <laughs> dynasty. Because <laughs> there will be another Kirkpatrick coming along soon because his son is about 70 and we'll get the same old crap, we'll get the same old happy sheep nonsense, we'll get the assessment, summative assessment nonsense at level two, we'll never get to level three because nobody in their right mind walks around with a flip chart following an employee to see if they've got the erratic scores. And of course we'll never get to level four, the only one that really matters. We're so busy doing one, two and three that the rest is wiped out. Happy sheet, you know, what a nonsense. Absolutely nothing about learning whatsoever. These two guys, Black and William, brilliant feedback gurus, love these guys. And you really, I think we really in L&D have to take this very seriously now, that feedback really matters. And that actually formative feedback is where all our effort should go into, not those little bits of summative assessment. And it has to be very precise and constructive. And I'm gonna to come to a bit of technology that does this so well, so well that it's mind boggling in a minute. Remember that tests are terminal. You know, even a bright kid who gets 85% in an exam still has failed in 15% of it, but that's regarded as a success. I like vocational learning. I'm involved with Satan Girls and all sorts of call it, FE college. I like their attitude, which is you have to reach full competence. And it's not about just getting a, a test mark above a threshold in a written text exam. We know how poor that is in terms of actual measurement of competencies and skills. Don't mark, don't mark. Okay, and then a couple of, I've just put these in because they're friends of mine. <laughs> but these uh, 
uh, we do have, seriously, though, Jay Cross and that whole informal learning thing that was mentioned by somebody this morning. I wholly agree with that. That's a rising star as a social media. Jane Hart's done a lot of work there. And then a couple of guys who are big on testing, Norman and Nielsen. And we still don't do enough user testing with all that e-learning stuff. I know that because a lot of what I see wouldn't even reach the market if you did user testing. You know, paragraph of text, take a noun, find something on Google Images, slap it on the right-hand side. I pepper it with a few multiple choice questions and a little quiz at the end of the module. We were doing that 30, 40 years ago and walk out into this exhibition and you'll see oodles of it still. It's not good enough. It's not good enough to commoditize it like this. But there are new kids on the block. Technology doesn't matter. Well, I'm damn pleased that uh, Tim Berners-Lee gave us those three bits of technology, HTTP, HTML, and URLs. That's how the internet works. He gave us the World Wide Web. That's why we're all here today. It matters, folks, that people like this came along and shaped the learning landscape, as did Bill Gates, the late great uh, Jobs, and, of course, the Google guys, Page and Brin. Now, of course, we have Wikipedia, Jimmy Wales, absolutely wonderful, a huge, amazing knowledge base. Uh, I'm not too sure that people get into the pub to discuss Wikipedia, do they? Do they go for that social learning experience? Or do they just look up Wikipedia? Jesus, we don't have to just get into rooms all the time to learn things. We have to get over that one. Jeff Bezos revolutionized the buying of books, that whole, that wonderful thing, the hyperlink, which is the basis of the really sophisticated learning we do in the web. Uh, sorry. And of course, the Facebook guy, I'm going to show you a bit of technology associated with him, Salman Khan. And then the new kids on the block here, a really interesting species of people, AI, machine intelligence people, Sebastian Thrun, Peter Norvig, uh, Nigan Kohler from Coursera. This is an interesting guy, absolute genius mathematician, a chess champion and so on, just sold his company to Google for 400 million, an algorithm writer. These are the guys who are and will shape the learning landscape. Okay. It's a World Cup and it's a game of two halves. That was all the learning theory, okay? And if you want to look at, I've written serious articles about every single one of those people on my, on my website and blog, so you can go and have a look. And if you really want to drill into detail, you can. Let's turn to the technology for a minute. And the first one I want to address, what can you learn from all those people over those two and a half thousand years? What are the themes, the good themes we can pluck out? And one of them is personalized learning. This goes back to Socrates, also the Enlightenment people, but also the memory theorists. You really have to pay attention to what all these people were saying about the individual being a bit different. You know, and it was, it, if you're going to teach somebody somebody or somebody's going to learn, they do have an existing set of knowledge, which is a bit like a neural network. So just feeding them linear stuff, linear lectures, linear books, linear papers, ain't enough, or even linear e-learning. You have to do something more sophisticated if you're really going to get that new knowledge accepted by that particular individual brain. So what's coming along here? Well, the big example is Google. Google, in my view, 1997, really took off about 2000, was the biggest pedagogic shift in the history of our species. It was a massive pedagogic shift when suddenly you could ask any question and pretty much get a good answer. This is revolutionary for all sorts of reasons in learning, and it's why every single learner on the planet uses it so often. So you get to stuff. Uh, then we have the hyperlink. Social media works because of hyperlinking. You know, if you use Twitter a lot, it's always a little link in the end to the research and that matters. It's not that little link. I don't often say, oh, look, somebody's tweeted that they're going to the pub today. I'll rush out to the pub. It's not about that action in the real world. It's often action hyperlinking to other knowledge in that network, which is the World Wide Web. That's what really matters here. Because our brains, in a sense, are hyperlinked entities. That's metaphorical to a degree. But the hyperlink is the warp driver learning. It's what makes it really work. It's what makes really good e-learning work, not the linear page type stuff that we so often see because we do not store stuff alphabetically or linearly or hierarchically like books or lectures. We store things uh, in our own internal networks and social media is a perfect example of that. Okay, this first piece of technology I want to talk about. You won't have heard much about this because not much is happening in the UK on it. But adaptive learning. And you've got to be, I'm going to be precise what I mean by this. There's a lot of talk about big data. Hardly any big data exists in education, to be honest, because it's all hermetically sealed even in your company. You don't share much with other people. But let me explain what I mean here. Data in education and training is, by and large, crap data. And it's small data. It's not big data. It's bums and seats. And the old line is, of course, bums and seats, wrong end of the learner. You're, there's nothing out here. It's got nothing to do with learner. I don't care how many people turned up. Contact time in universities, they don't even measure how many kids turn up to lectures. They don't actually know that, which is pretty weird. 
So don't tell me about contact time, because you don't actually know how many hours of contact time your students got, even though they paid 9,900 a year for it. They don't turn up to the lectures. Imagine running a restaurant where people have prepaid for the meal and don't turn up. You go, we must have crap food. Uh, Kirkpatrick, that sort of crap data. I've had a go at him already. Summative assessments and happy sheets. But let's look at some other weird things in the learning world that you may be familiar with. This top image is from uh, Robinson. You know the TED talk that Robinson gave? I don't know if you remember this, when he was talking about Ritalin and the epidemic that's sweeping from, the west to, from east to west. It was actually completely made up by Robinson. Be very careful with this TED talk stuff. The truth of the matter is that this is the map. Not that. And that these white areas are only white because they didn't supply any data. It's got nothing to do with the actual Ritalin use in it at all. So when you dig down beneath some of this TED Talk data, you find that actually the picture that's painted is much more sophisticated and messy and doesn't convey the message that it's an epidemic sweeping from liberal East Coast across America. It doesn't show that at all, as you can see here. In fact, Texas is one of the big areas for that. Another one, <laughs> this is interesting. Nigel actually told me that he saw this at an e-learning conference in Istanbul last week that you know this graph up here that you may have seen in crap train the trainer courses? It was around the CIPD for a long time, this. 10% we learn from reading, 20% from seeing, 30% from hearing, you know, that sort of thing. Now, anybody with any maths is going, what are the chances of those being rounded figures? <laughs> Absolutely nil. And of course, when they, this was looked into by a number of different people, actually, and they found that this reference was completely bogus, but this became a meme in train the trainer courses. Even Berson was using it, Mr. Berson, the great uh, consultant stroke guru, 10%, 30%, 50%. He added another one on, on at the end in terms of teaching that. Completely bogus, completely made up, but still around in train the trainer courses. With Cyril, but Pisa, Pisa, suddenly they lobbed Shanghai in, one city, not the whole of China, because if you did it for the whole of China, they'd be at the bottom of the list. Up here, the first learning management system. You may not know who these people is. This is Hitler on the left, and the guy on the right-hand side was uh, the chief executive of IBM, who sold them a learning management system called the Hollerith machine. It was a punch card system, and it categorized people according to their skills for labor camps. Not only that, it categorized people in terms of whether they were gay, Jews, gypsies. Data is not always such a great thing in education. If you look at, I contacted this guy, the Times World University Rankings. I contacted about University of Edinburgh, University of Edinburgh, right up the top there in the British rankings. I said, how did you reach that position? Because at the same year, 2012, Edinburgh came plumb bottom in the student survey on teaching. Absolutely bottom of the league table. So I said, well, how can that be? And he said, oh, well, it's only 30% of the rankings on teaching. I said, what are they? And they were, they were nonsense. They were proxies. They were absolute nonsense. None of these rankings take teaching into consideration. Isn't that amazing? That a university pays no attention to teaching in terms of rankings? It's an absolute con. So data and learning. I think it's quite nice to look at brain data, learner data, some course components to see if you can improve the course. Was that a good question, a good bit of video? Is it too long, too short? That's great. The rest up here we don't, we hardly gather at all except in MOOC land. But we have something to learn from these people. Every time you type a few characters into that little Google box, a huge amount of algorithmic power is right at that point of presence. Right at that letter you type, a huge amount of maths is working trying to predict what you want as an answer to that question. And Amazon, you order a book, it knows, its algorithm knows what books you looked at previously, what other sites you looked at in terms of those goods. Clear your cookies if you want cheap prices. Amazing amount of predictive power. And they reckon that now getting up to a third or more of their sales comes from the algorithmic power of their software. Facebook's the same. Those ads you see are all algorithm driven. Netflix actually put a competition out and two guys won it. They wrote the algorithms, got the million dollar prize. It now accounts for 75% of their recommended sales in movies. And the famous example of Target, you're probably bored with this anecdote now, but Target, every one horse town in America has got a Target. You'll have seen them, no doubt, if you've traveled there. They now know that women are pregnant before those women tell them they're pregnant. And the famous story, which is true, uh, of the guy who went and his 15-year-old daughter got this little voucher for baby clothes. He was marching into Target and says, lawsuit, $10 million, here's my lawyer, only to, turn out, uh, only to find that his daughter was indeed pregnant. In other words, the power of the maths was superior 
to, uh, to his ability, or indeed the lawyer's ability. These things are starting to get really good. If you use dating sites, especially eHarmony, huge amount of sophistication now in terms of algorithmic prediction of whether that relationship is likely to last or not, based on huge data sets about whether uh, those characteristics led to long-term relationships or marriage. And even in the World Cup, even in the World Cup, a brilliant book called The Numbers Game by two American academics, every Premier League come, uh, club in England has several analysts now looking at data and applying clever algorithms, not only to the transfer market, but to the performance of those players. Nobody goes into a football match now without doing this seriously. Now, do we take that view of the world as, as learning professionals? I don't think we do yet, but I think perhaps we will. And this is to do with adaptive learning. I'm not going to go through all of this. Adaptive learning, to keep it simple, do not think that adaptive learning is just branching. We've seen that in e-learning. You know, you get something wrong, maybe a little remedial loop based on an if, x, then, y uh, branch in the code. It's not even about rule sets, and I was just trickling through lots of if-thens to see what you might determine. And it's certainly not about learning styles, you know, determining the learning styles of your learners before you start the course. That will get you absolutely nowhere. And you may end up doing the wrong thing. It is about an, an integrated adaptive network. And uh, after I move on here, this company here was identified by the Gates Foundation as the most sophisticated adaptive learning company on the planet. And it's in, it's in Britain, interestingly, although hardly anybody's ever heard of them. And what they do is they have 20 algorithms, a bit like a sat-nav. So if you have a sat-nav in your car, it knows where you've come from, it knows where you've got to get to, and if you go off piste, those algorithms, because they're massively algorithmic driven, sat-navs, will get you back onto the track to make sure you get to your destination in the most optimal and efficient way. Well, the same should apply to learning. Rather than that, we all do the same course, trundling through those e-learning courses in a very predictable man manner because they're all the same. Actually, what this company does is every, in real time, every new screen that's presented in an e-learning program is a result of the algorithmic power and how much they know about you as a learner. It's truly personalized, just as your sat-nav is personalized for your car. It knows what you've learned before. It tries to predict what you don't know. And if you know a lot, it will get you through the course much quicker, saving oodles of time and money. It will give you real support if you don't know much and make sure it doesn't take you too far too quickly. This is how e-learning will be in the future. It has to be, otherwise we'll be stuck in the page turning modality. Okay, adaptive learning algorithm. If it works for Google, it works for Facebook, it works for Amazon, it works for all these companies, it's gonna work for us. It's just a matter of time. And it's a way out of that trap, I think, uh, of the linearity of your learning. The second one is lifelong learning. And this is interesting because in the Enlightenment, certainly when those people like Locke wrote about education, they say, well, don't imagine that education just stops at school. That's stupid. You know, our minds don't close down as soon as we've got a college degree, you know. The whole notion of lifelong learning was always a great hope, but it didn't really happen because we're still obsessed by going to uni and our 18-year-old undergraduates and so on. But these people, Roger Shank and others, started to look in a more expansive way at learning in terms of our ongoing CPD development. You know, our, our general learning path as individuals, and most of us here are not 18-year-old undergraduates, but have been on such a path. And this is what all these technology guys were on about. This is why these guys, their mission statement was to, was to gather as much evidence as they can uh, and spread free knowledge throughout the world. They have a far better mission statement than most universities, I know. And then we have all these guys at the bottom who are working hard to give us that personalized experience in producing this thing here called MOOCs. And I want to put a different spin on MOOCs for a minute because they're not going to replace universities. They're about you guys in this room, actually. They are getting away from this simple supply-led, scarce, small numbers offline, 9,900 pounds a year nonsense to demand-led, abundant, massive numbers online, anywhere, anytime, and open. That's what we're going to be after here, okay? Increasingly, I think you should be looking at MOOCs because they are an absolute free flipped resource for you as L&D people. And interestingly, the way the pendulum swing is happening in MOOCs is they are becoming more vocational and practical. You can see the liberal arts agenda sort of fade away a little bit. They're all about coding. They're all about business skills. They're all about IT. They're all about the sort of things that you guys run lots of courses on. That's marvelous. Don't be worried about dropout. That word dropout was really just something that people plucked out from another context. University dropout, college dropout, tried to apply to MOOCs, nonsense. I don't drop out of Wikipedia. And if I drop out a MOOC, that's fine. That's what they are. It only takes a couple of minutes to sign up. Dropping out's okay. I'm just amazed that 23 million people have bloody well dropped in. 
I'm a drop in, I ain't a drop out. People love MOOCs. Sure, the initial lot, we're all graduates, that's just because in any, I've been in the tech business 30 years, it's always the same. You get the early adopters who tend to be the first people who bought mobile phones, uh, you know, were the techie sort of people. That's true, you always get early adoption, it will change as we go on. Interestingly, what's changing up here is most of the people up here now starting to take MOOCs are people like you and me, with kids, jobs, who want to learn something new, sometimes just on their own, but very often for advancement in our profession and so on. Sorry. So, are they poor pedagogy? I think not. I've taken eight of the damn things. Absolutely brilliant. Four of them have certainly been superior to the courses I got at an Ivy League university in the States and Edinburgh University here in the UK. Uh, because they're paying attention to what you really need. If it's semantic memory, you won't see the lecture. You'll see the semantic mass. If you're learning algorithmic theory, that's what you need. I don't want to see the face of the lecturer necessarily. Are they bad on assessment? Well, only 33% of people who take MOOCs want a, want a certificate anyway. I'm not too sure about you at your age. I don't want another bit of paper. I've got several. I don't give a toss. And neither do 66% of the people taking MOOCs, so don't get hung up on certification in MOOCs. And if you do want it, there's amazing online things. You don't have to wait till the end of the year to do it. Do employers like them? Yes, they do. In fact, I quite admire a kid who's taken a MOOC, got up off the backside, did it on their own, didn't just turn up to college, go to uni, three years and drunken meander through the sort of course. Yeah, I quite like the idea of the self motivated learner. And then the last one, learning by doing. I really want to, don't worry about all these people who support it. I want to bring you to this one. And that's it here, the Oculus Rift. This is why I love technology. Oculus Rift has just been bought by Facebook for $2 billion. Think of that figure for a minute. $2 billion. YouTube was only bought for $1.6 billion. Why did Mark Zuckerberg buy the Oculus Rift for $2 billion? Read the press release. Right at the top is the word learning and education. How bizarre. How bizarre, because we have, for the first time perhaps, a real breakthrough in simulations and learn by doing. This will be a $300 device that will be bought in its millions in 2015. And if you want to get an idea of what this is about, it's about very sophisticated simulated training, a bit like flight sims brought into competencies in management and IT and so on. Let me just show you this, the effect that this can have on people. This guy's been demoed it in a mall for the first time. Just a roller coaster thing. <laughs> and that's all this is. I thought it was a $300 device. Look at the effect I had. Now, I've, I've tested this out. I've been in Africa, I've been all over Europe with it. Amazing reactions from not only educators who immediately get it. 3D sims right inside your mind. The reptile brain says you're there doing construction skills, whatever. Okay, I've been using this one in the space that you actually see one 3D image inside the mask. I've been using this with kids in a trial, teaching them Newton's three laws. You're in a little way. Uh, a uh, sort of space suit, and when you press the button, the jetpack goes this way, you go that way, that's Newton's third law. Let a kid experience it like that, they'll never forget it. Newton's first law, an object will continue ad infinitum unless another force is applied to it, remember that one? When the kid presses the button and goes forward, they're amazed because the space suit keeps on going and going and going and they crash into the space station, because life on Earth, that doesn't happen, friction's... Newton's first law, they'll never forget it. Or you can teach this from a flip chart as F equals negative F. What would you rather have? Absolutely amazing possibilities in this thing. And we're doing all sorts of wonderful things in terms of not only teaching science, teaching history, teaching biology. Let me get forward. We have, as UFI, we've funded two big simulations, one in social care. We know the problems in social care homes with the ethics and the, the actual competencies of people who are carers. We're gonna be building uh, well, we are, we have built one, a 3D model of a care home, teaching the real competencies. Not only can you train those competencies, you can assess those competencies, and in the States, we're seeing signs that these simulations are certifying people, certifying people. Uh, this gas simulation here, you actually go into a house and you do your gas inspection like a corgi gas inspector, and if you leave the window open and it blows the gas away and you do the meter, you feel the competence. The physics is that good. It's better than real-time assessors. Better. Isn't that amazing? Because remember, simulations are not about mimicking the real world. They're about allowing you to do things that are impossible in the real world. 
That's why you wouldn't go on an airplane if your pilot hadn't done 300 hours of flight simulations. And that's what we need to bring into learning that are medical applications. The next one's high resolution 1080, just like your television, it will look fantastic. That's Jay Cross in Africa, up there we went on. These are African kids. And I'm gonna tell you a story which blew my mind. When I was in Africa, there was a group of the, it was a friend of this kid down here, came up to, wasn't this kid. And I didn't take a picture because it was sensitive. And he had cerebral palsy, this kid, in a wheelchair. And he came rolling up with his mates. And uh, he wanted to try it out. And we put the Oculus Rift on him. And for the first time in his life, he did a budgie jump. He walked to the edge of the thing and leapt off. And you should have seen the look in the face of these other kids. They were in tears from them. Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing that we could have provided that experience. And then we did put him on a roller coaster. We allowed him to walk through rooms. Absolutely astounding effect. I've never had anything. I'm welling up almost thinking about it. If we don't think this is applicable, then think again and think of that kid, because we're doing kids a disservice. First of all, by giving them too much academic education at the expense of vocational learning. We're crippling our FE colleges, 17.5% ripped out the budget and put into HE. This is wrong, it's wrong. Gove, swiping out every vocational course in our schools, but still wants Latin, that's bloody well wrong because there are kids like that kid with cerebral palsy that need real skills in the real world and some employability and some hope going forward. And that's what this technology will give us, the new ones coming outside. So personalized learning, lifelong learning MOOCs, learn by doing with this stuff. Yes, the technology does damn well matter and we should embrace it and love it. Resistance is futile anyway because all those young people are gonna buy it by the millions. Thanks very much for listening. But by the way, just to end, I'm going to set up the Oculus Rift. It'll be around all afternoon. If you haven't tried this thing, try it. It will blow your mind. Okay, questions. Have we got any mics anywhere? If not, I'll repeat the question. Anyone got a first question? A challenge? Yes. <coughs> oh. oh, my goodness. How do you start introducing this in, in corporates from where it is currently? How do you start introducing it in corporates from well, where it is what's currently? It? What's the it? Uh, well, this, the Oculus Rift. Oh, the Oculus Rift. Well, learning by doing, okay. participation, simulation, all of those things. Right, okay, well, let's take them one by one. The MOOC thing is already happening. You already have 23 million people with jobs doing CPD on their own. Isn't that curious? Outside of L&D in a way. Some L&D departments are actually using them in anger though and recommending that students, you, you know, that, that they, if you're running a course on X, and there's a really brilliant one run by Harvard, but the guy who wrote the book, book that you're recommending, just shove them towards the MOOC. It's bloody well free. How good does that get? I think the algorithmic learning thing will take a while. It will come through the states first, but it will definitely hit e-learning companies eventually in this country because, you know, the, the quantum leap in productivity from a learner's po point of view is so great, it's, it would be, well, look at Google. <laughs> look at Google. That's algorithms, guys, and we have to start using them. The third one, Oculus Rift, this is released in 2015. The sales figures, I mean, Facebook have one and a half billion people. They spent two billion on this, it's not gonna fail. First of all, the games industry, all your kids will have one of these. They reckon they might sell more of these than all the consoles that have ever been sold in the history of our species, as it were. Uh, on top of that, you already, we're already spiking the market, producing simulations in retail training, apprenticeships, practical skills for FE colleges, and also training providers. So that started to happen, construction. It will come, it will take time but I think it's up to companies themselves to, in my experience, people like yourself, experienced educators and L&D people, immediately think of five applications of that as soon as they take the helmet off. They go, wow, I know exactly how I would use this. And you're probably thinking right now of some of the things you could do in your world with it. It will take time, institutional resistance, of course, but consumer technology always comes through. We do all have mobile phones. We do all use Google and Wikipedia. It wins out in the end. The technology will win out. It's just that technology is always ahead of the sociology. Always is. Anyone else? Questions? Yeah. How uh, much does it cost? Uh, the, the price point, projected price point is $300. $300 ain't much. And no. that's because they're going for young people. The disposable income of a young gamer, if you go above 300, that becomes, it sort of becomes more than the price of the console. $300, once you try this, you go, wow. Because this, this might change the whole entertainment industry, you know? Like we're buying big widescreen televisions, bigger and bigger and bigger. This just takes it around the back of your head so you're in the movie. 
Uh, what about the software? How, how, can anyone? Yeah. Well, that's, that's going to be that's different. What you do, just like the movie industry, this is just like your flat screen TV. Yeah. Really, you're buying the the, the 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 kit. There will, of course, be all the every games developer in the world is looking at this. The games, by the way, are astonishing. Even if you've never played a lot of games, it's not really shoot 'em up stuff. It's horror games. You know, like those films, Paranormal, <laughs> or you're the babysitter and the creepy guys upstairs. I'm, honestly, you, you get scared shitless in this thing. <laughs> But that's what I pay for. That's why I go and see those movies. It's just going to be a lot better. So there's games type stuff. I, I, I speak to a guy called Jim Landy, a t a Turner uh, a, a Prize uh, artist. Artists are looking at this thing. Not only entertainment, but the learning thing. The interesting thing is Zuckerberg putting learning in the press release. That's interesting. Isn't that interesting? Because Facebook never went anywhere near learning historically. So $300, of course, if, you do, if you're a training provider, the cost of assessing somebody just on a gas inspection is really expensive. You're talking about getting on for a grand, whereas this can do it, you know, it's a million times free. You can actually put millions of people through the simulation for pennies. That's the reduction in costs you're going to get. You will have to, of course, pay back the people who built the simulations, but that's life and that's commerce. It just will be a lot cheaper and a lot more efficient. If, if you, yes, go. Just, just one there and we'll come out of Go on. How, how do we weed out the, the bullshit that you, you've been battling for a, a long time. There's lots of people <coughs> the side. How do we weed that out of the L&D profession generally? How do we... Sure, yeah. sure. That's a good question. I'll just repeat that. How do we weed out the bullshit from the L&D profession? It's a good question, this. Well, I think, you know, I'm going to be really hard here. First of all, I have never joined a club and I've never joined the CIPD because I think they're not wholly to blame, but partly to blame. All that sort of regimented, let's all march to the same tune type train the trainer and teach the trainer courses. When, train, when teacher training went into university, it's got highly academicized. They teach secondary school teachers by lecturing at them. I've taught 16 year old kid math. You would never lecture to a bunch of 16 year old boys or you get crucified. That's how crap this stuff is. They don't even know what good pedagogy is when they're teaching teaching. This has to go. Now, how do we do that? I think we've got to scrap the existing, you know, just ignore all that stuff. Ignore the CIPD and train the trainer courses and stick to the science, just like everybody else does. You know, a good engineer knows physics. That's why you can go over a bridge safely. In the learning world, we don't really know good learning theory. In fact, it's full of stuff that make bridges a bit wobbly and shaky and hardly anybody gets to the other side. But the question is, I think we have to take responsibility for ourselves and challenge people who say, I'm a social constructivist. Well, can you name a social constructivist? Which paper, which book did you, what, what Vygotsky text have you read? Did you read Mind and Society? Did you really read that book? I haven't met one who has. I've not met a social constructivist yet outside academia who has read any of the texts because it's a liberal orthodoxy that's been panned at you through anecdote. I'm sorry, but that's what we got this morning. The kid in India who is the world champion golfer is a Silicon Valley narr narrative about young kids getting rich and making it rich on the web. And that ain't the future for our kids. It's only the future for a tiny handful of people. We have to get out of this idea that people have to go into rooms to learn. It has to be face to face. No, that's never been a necessary condition for learning. That's what the technology has shown us. We have to bite the bullet on that one and get rid of all the crap theory that suggests that you always have to be with other people to learn. Because that's what we were being told this morning. Oh, you have to go and meet in Starbucks if you're doing a MOOC. No, I bloody well don't. I'm sorry to be so harsh, but if, we're going to, if you're going to stop the bullshit, we may as well challenge the bullshit. Just here, Donald. Yeah, sorry. Very specific question. Did you say that there's a health and social care yeah. simulation already? Health, it's, health and yeah, social health and care social. simulation, does it exist? Yes, it, it's in production, will be ready before the end of this year, 2014, and then available for sale. Uh, city and guilds are producing one in construction. There's another one being produced that I know of in retail for the kids who go and work in supermarkets, banks, and so on, you know, like customer service type stuff, because you can have avatars and all sorts of things inside these. Three, you can build any 3D world you want. So we'll see a whole number of learning applications for sale early 2015, absolutely. Which will be... A, you know, think of this, if you're involved in social care, the training is highly fragmented, a bit odd, and fails a lot of the time. We really, mm. have, a, we really have a chance of doing things well and cheaply here. Mm. Um, next question, have some. Yep. Um, we talk about building shaky bridges, Donald. Yeah. Um, so when can we stop telling our organisations how many people have crossed that shaky bridge? And is that the information that our organisations want? 
Shaky well, bridges yeah. and data I mean, and uh, numbers and all that stuff. I think that's right. I went, I got invited along to speak at HSBC's annual do, learning do, and the chief learning officer. Her first slide was how many lunches they had served in the canteen in the training center. And I felt like, I, I'm not going to speak, I'm going to walk out. This is just ridiculous. And I did a lot of work with banks where this, you know, look what happened there. You know, look what happened on ethics and compliance training in the Royal Bank of Scotland and HBOSC. I worked for all of those people. It absolutely nearly took us and our kids under because it didn't do an ounce of good. We knew it wasn't doing any good. And we're still delivering compliance training. Oodles and oodles of the stuff that people don't like. They find it boring and they don't learn a damn thing from it. In fact, the diversity training side of things is really interesting because the data shows that a lot of it's slightly counterproductive, slamming people into rooms and always being pseudo-accusatory about things. There's some really good diversity training, but what works really well in diversity is change in management practice, not training. We don't do enough of that. Training's too much of a default. We do too much of it in a funny sort of way. Mm. But yeah, tell, I think we should, it's a good question. Stand up to them. Come back with a hard hitting data. Come back with the science every time. No, this is wrong, you're wrong. Because they all have that dinner party view. Everybody has a view in learning. Everybody thinks they're an expert and they're not. We're the experts, but we have to identify what our expertise is, I think. <laughs> as long as we learn 10% by seeing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah go on. This stuff is definitely coming, and yeah. I'd, I'd like to do it now. How can we get ahead of the game? What should we do now? Okay. How do we get ahead of the okay. game? Right, well, see, I, I think always with technology, start with playing with the sun, take a MOOC yourself. And I know, I know that many of you have, because we gave a MOOC session in January, and a forest of arms went up. Because you're learning people, you love this stuff. And most of the people, when we asked them, really liked it, like me. So I think, first of all, is get your learning, you know, your team, take a MOOC, take a MOOC. Then, really think about how you can apply. Remember, it's a free resource, so it's falling off a log list, really. Think about identifying a really relevant course for your organization in business, marketing, IT, whatever, and give it a shot. Sorry, I'm in the Oculus Rift. Oh, the Oculus Rift, oh, sorry. Oh, yeah. yeah, well, I'm, I'm picking the easiest one first there. Well, on Oculus, I mean, I, I think that, like, I don't think it's a do-it-yourself world, necessarily. I don't think it's one of those things where we'll just bash out some e learning, you know, within our department, hire a couple of kids and hope for the best. Actually, it's a bit more like the sort of movie and television industry where you really need a very good team with learning professionals in that team. And there's a company in Britain called Caspian Learning whom we are using. There are other bits of software like Unity and so on. Caspian Learning, I highly recommend because the two people who started that company are learning professionals. And their whole software that allows you to build these scenarios is built around learning scenarios and good science, the stuff I've been talking about. Caspian Learning, that, uh, look at their website. They're doing the simulations that we're funding from UFI. Uh, but these things will hit the market and they'll be relatively cheap. So you can buy them and put people through those training courses. You know, it'll be like traditional market in that sense. Are we, you One can, question you, over there. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yep, over there. That's about, what, yeah. what is the danger of bad algorithms and loss of transparency? Well, you know, I'm, I'm not, when, when you sit down, like in Cogbooks, I know quite a bit about the 22 algorithms that you use. And if you ask that question of those algorithms, it would be a funny question to ask, because one of them is around space practice, and you go, well, yeah, well, where's the accusation here? What's going to go wrong here? Now, things can go wrong. Well, just like when you get a really odd ad coming up, you know, when you're in, uh, when you're in Google or in Facebook, sometimes you get odd things happening. The great thing about Google is the more data you gather, the more power the algorithms have. And some of these algorithms are self-learning, machine learning algorithms, so they get better and better and better. So the more you use this software, the better it becomes which is an amazing thing in itself. So you will get some shaky results at the beginning, but already the trials in the States show that you get this massive increase in productivity anyway. But there is, you're right about the data thing, but I think that's a big data issue, not a little data issue, you know, about where the data is held. But mostly algorithmic data is used in real time and anonymized, you know? It's because it's within the learning experience, it's not necessarily, you don't need to export that, that, the data that's used in the algorithms while they're being used as it was, just like your sat nav, you willingly give up to the algorithm that's getting you to your destination. You don't really worry about whether there's many privacy issues around that one. But there are privacy issues about the outcomes. In other words, who passed what exam and where that data goes and where it's stored and so on, very definitely. But I think it's over a little bit. I don't worry about 
Google necessarily knowing what I'm searching for. I genuinely don't. Uh, I know there's a bit of a downside with the NSA, but I'd rather just take the NSO he head on and support Snowden and get on with that, that, that battle rather than stop things. Because the danger, a bit like the inclusion agenda, and I always use this example, I was brought up in a house that didn't have any books, but I never ever heard anybody saying, we're not going to use books in schools because Donald doesn't have any books at home. But I do hear that argument used in technology all the time. I think the inclusion agenda has, and I know it has in our school, I was a, you know, a, a, a governor in a, a comprehensive school, it absolutely stopped things happening in the school because some kids didn't have a PC at home. Big deal, we'll buy them a PC. They can go to the library. We have to get around this looking for reasons not to do things. I'm not, that's not what you're saying. But we have to just get on with it and cope with those things. You know, we buy cars. We know that 3,000 people get killed every year by cars in the UK, but we don't stop driving. Every bit of technology is a downside. But we can't let the little downside affect the massive upside. It's a great place to end. I think we should, we're on time now to finish. Donald, thank you for picking us up, slamming us around the head, <laughs> challenging us, and leaving <coughs> us thinking. Thank you. It's great. Thank you. Great to, great to, great to. Thank you.